Hi, this is Ed Rising, and welcome to Ed's Popomatic Podcast. We have another exciting episode today with a fun panel. Uh, today's episode uh, will be on this, the music and concert performances of Barry Manilow. And I have two uh, special guests with me today, Lance Lumley and Daniel Costin. And so um, I'm going to introduce... Um, introduce these guys right off the bat, and we're gonna start talking about um, uh, the concert experiences and, and generally what they do, you know, what they're known for, and if they give it a little background as to what they, you know, you know what, 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 their, their, what their backgrounds are. So Lance, take it away. No, oh, okay. Well, um, my name is Lance Lumley, and I'm also a blogger. Um, I'm also a published editor, and uh, proofreader for a couple of pro wrestling books. Um, I do my own blog, which reviews um, books, movies, but a lot of retro CDs. I've also written for um, a Canadian website that does like hair metal retro and reviews, but um, it's just exciting to talk about music and I'm, uh, especially music that some people have passed over, you know, and if my whole site was um, kind of like the kiss thing where it's the site that I wanted to see, but nobody was writing about it. You know, you don't see people writing about Barry Manilow or rare 80s stuff or whatever. So um, I, that's what I do. <laughs> what is the name of the site? Um, it is uh, lancewrites.wordpress.com. Um, W-R-I-T-E-S, writes, you know, writing. But yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, it's just a fun little hobby I do. and. You know, if you feel like you want to check it out, check it out. And cool. And uh, Daniel? I'm Daniel not sure what I am, but I, I'm kind of a lot of things. I'm a photographer, writer, written several books on music, mostly in North Carolina. I have uh, now been producing records for the last few years, including the new album by The Circle, which, by the way, has been sold by, or been bought by Big Stir Records for a release next year. Uh, I uh, released one Left Bank album last year and soon about to release another. So uh, stay tuned, as well as some acts here in this area. And uh, again, um, and I'll mention too, Lance, that I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, a huge hub for wrestling. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually went and saw uh, wrestling on Christmas Day in 1983 with Ricky Steamboat and uh, the Koloffs. And I met Ivan and Nikita and I actually met... Um, uh, uh, Hulk Hogan and uh, Ric Flair when they got together for an event here in 2009. So uh, yes, uh, I'm a geek for that too. But, uh, <laughs> but believe it or not, I'm also a geek for Barry Manilow, which I like, like, like you guys, it's, it's a lifelong um, uh, uh, listening experience. So I look forward to talking about that. Sweet. Cool. And so um, uh, Daniel, uh, many of my uh, viewers should know, um, Danny, Daniel and I got to know, know each other working with Plastic EP on his many panel shows and pop news culture shows. And so uh, we've had a lot of fun doing that over the years. A uh, year and a half, I guess, it's been a while now. And uh, so, um, all right, so Lance, can you tell us, talk to us a little bit about your concert experiences with Barry Manilow? Sure, sure. The first, I've seen Barry, let's see, six times. Um, and uh i discovered him watching pbs one day um on the uh greatest hits and then some dvd that they did the wembley stadium show and i stumbled upon it and i was like captured by it i was playing a drummer in a band at the time and i was just like this is amazing so i actually um got to see him for the first time in august 10th and 97 i think it was at um Outside Pittsburgh, it's called Burgesstown. It was an amphitheater called Star Lake. And it was almost like I was destined to be there because, I, you know, back in the day when we had to stand in line at Ticketmaster or, you know, National Record Mart to stand in line to get the tickets as opposed to the internet today. And uh, I went to the record store and I was so happy because I had my credit card. You know, I was like, all right, a credit card, you know, I'm going to buy very much <laughs> tickets. And I got there and they got the tickets and they said 10th row. And I'm like, awesome, you know? And then they're like, cash only. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. So 
luckily my mom was there and the, the tickets were $40, which doesn't seem like a lot now, but back then that was something. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom just, you know, she was there and she had the cash on me on her and she paid for my ticket. I paid her back, obviously. And um, but so my first Manilow show was like 10th row. And even looking back now, it's like, how did I get 10th row? Because, you know, a lot of fan clubs and stuff like that all got, you know, the first 20 rows or whatever. But um, my best friend at the time, he uh, I was just like, couldn't find anybody to go with. So um me and him always went to concerts together. So I was like, why don't you come with me to the Barry Nello concert? And he was like, I don't know. And so long, the, the backstory of this was he uh, recently broke up with his girlfriend at the time. So I wasn't thinking that, you know, Barry Manilow love songs, long lost loves, you know, things like that. Wouldn't it be the best idea to take him to, but <laughs> um it happened. He agreed to go. So I was like, oh, OK. So we got there and we're watching the show. And uh, got to tell you a little story about it is that he was dating a girl named Amy at the time. And for some reason, he had like four or five girlfriends in a row and their names were Amy. I don't know how he did it. Why? <laughs> and he was like, you know, years later, he would talk and he was like, hey, you remember Amy? I'm like, which one? You know, but um, he passed away a couple years ago, but it was, uh, it's such a funny story. We're sitting there and Barry starts talking and he's like, I'm going to do a song off of, um, my, um, Broadway album was it showstoppers. I think it was. And he says, it was a song that was famous by, uh, was it Roy Bolger who played the scarecrow in the wizard of Oz. And he says, you know, this song is called once in love with Amy. And my best friend just yelled. It was dead silence. And he yelled up to the stage. He's like, God, no. <laughs> and I just looked and, you know, he, Barry heard him because Barry's went, apparently somebody knew Amy. And then <laughs> started singing the song. But and on the way home and for years, I never heard him swear at me so much and just like <laughs> about, you, I broke up with my girlfriend and you took me to a Barry Manilow concert <laughs> and song about Amy you know and I'm like yeah well what can you do and needless to say he never went back to another concert with me so I don't know if, <laughs> if that hurt him or what. he always went to him and his other buddies went on their own and I was stuck going to see Barry by myself so yeah I got to see Barry uh five more times and um the one was um the i think it was the clicker tour where he had the video wall and they would randomly randomly choose a song and they would play and then i saw him with the uh big band the sinatra salute that he did with a 30-piece orchestra and then i mm. saw the the farewell tour obviously he's still touring but uh, <laughs> that was another great thing because um i got loge seats for that up in cleveland my father worked for a company and they say hey you want free tickets to see barry Manilow?" we're like yeah well, obviously my son loves them and here they were a uh, loge seat so we were looking over top of the stage so there was just like 20 of us and you know free food and everything like that and then I saw him in Pittsburgh um, in 09. And then the last time I saw him was uh, August in 2011. And that was at the Cavelli Center in Youngstown, Ohio, which is about 20 minutes from me. And he played with the YSU Orchestra. And mm -hmm. that was great. And um, I've seen bands, you know, artists. I've seen Kiss. I've seen, you know, a lot of hard rock. Folk, but that was that show was remember memorable for me too because it's the only time I was right next to a fist fight, and I got a fist fight at the saw a fist fight at the Barry Manilow show. And I'm just saying right now, I'm afraid to go to see Air Supply because there may be a mosh pit. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm just afraid. So, <laughs> um, th this guy was just had too much to drink, and he just started <laughs> mouthing off to a guy in front of him. And next thing you know, the guy jumped over and my you know 70 year old father was right next to him and he was like you know i expect this at the wrestling shows but not a barry Manilow show and, you know, so <laughs> there was always something exciting at the barry Manilow shows i guess so that's <laughs> some of my concert experiences with that please have the worst in it sometimes right <laughs> uh, yeah well and uh the one when i went to pittsburgh on the way down i uh my jeep was rattling the whole time and um 
here it was, you know, a whole bunch of car repairs. And I was working at a grocery store at the time and I requested the day after off. And they're like, you really need a day after a Barry Manilow co concert to recover? <laughs> Needless to say, I was foreshadowing and I, my uh, $200 tickets that I paid cost me probably like $800 in Jeep repairs on the way back and up because, you know, the so, like I said, there was always something exciting about Barry Mello, even not seeing him live, you know, at going to or from the show. So it's, that's some of my concert experiences. Yeah, it, it was funny, you know. Once in a while, Cool. Uh, Daniel, do you want to share with us? Yeah. So I uh, first listened to Barry in the 70s. Um, I grew up in a steady diet of... Barry and um, John Denver and the Beatles and Simon and Garfunkel and uh, the occasional Neil Young records uh, and uh, I think a, be a Carpenter's Best Of. So, you know, uh, very uh, formative in my life. I did finally see Barry on my 11th birthday in 1984 on the Paradise Cafe tour. And uh, I remember enjoying it, but I now looking back and I was just recently looking at the set list and actually watching some some promo vi promo videos from that sh uh, that show sorry album i wish i could see that show with these eyes as opposed to being 11 because i was that age you're expecting the hits you expect the you know the live album and even now and all that and it was mm -hmm. a little different he was starting to transition into kind of what he got started doing throughout the 80s eventually doing the sinatra tour and all these you know more of his um collaborations with the johnny mercer estate so I appreciate that album a lot more now than I did back then, but it was still a really cool show. I was reflecting recently, I, that show was on my birthday in 84. I saw Tina Turner on my almost birthday in 85. And on my birthday the following year, I saw the Monkees on the, uh, the 86 tour. And so yeah. wasn't some good birthday shows. Yeah, uh, definitely. Back, yeah. yeah, thank you, mom and dad. Uh, <laughs> So I finally saw Barry again recently this January. I, I couldn't tell you why it's taken me so long to see him again. It's just, you know, I was busy with this and that. And I will mention that my wife actually saw Barry in 1976 on the tour that led up to the live album. Uh, and she hadn't seen Barry since 1976. And yes, he's a little older now. He's definitely, you know, piano and then but out front, but it's still a showman. Still, yeah. he knows yeah. that people want to hear him they want to hear those songs um he is a bit irascible now he is definitely more the you know um the veteran of the music business but darn they still got a ton of great songs and uh it was just really fun and uh i yes i did take pictures i couldn't bring my camera camera because that's you know um they don't usually unless you have a press pass you you know you don't get to bring in your real camera, but I've gotten really good at bringing in pocket cameras that people think, well, this thing's all taped up by duct tape, you know, um, yeah. can't, can't do any harm. And well, I do just fine. Thank you. So you do, uh, you do. In fact, I'm going to show you. Yeah. Uh, my audience uh, should know that Daniel Carson is a professional photographer. And so um, he shared with us a few of his pictures uh, of uh, the Manilow shows he went to this past January. And if uh, my computer is cooperating, then I'll be able to show you at least two of them here. Uh, is that coming through? Can you see that? I do not see them yet. Not, not yet. Okay, hold on. Let me let me see if I can. Yeah. If your computer doesn't work, they're the greatest photos you've ever seen of Barry Manilow, and you, you're just gonna have to take my word for it. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna share screen now, and right. I'm gonna go to this one here. Can you see that? Yep, there you go. Yep. Okay, so that's fantastic, Daniel. That's I mean, that that's just so dramatic, and he he loves that pose. So he's really yeah. he he's he honed that over the years. Yes, he gives good poses. Yeah, I will say that as as a visual person, he's like he hits his mark. You can follow him. You can say, okay, he's going to do this now. He's going to do that. Even when he's doing the the piano solos with the three guys, it's like, oh, you know, as a photographer, you're going, okay, this is awesome. I can shoot this from anywhere. It's going to look good. So and I had seats on the floor, found uh, seats a little further back, but actually very inexpensive. And uh, uh, all I needed was a, a straight line to see Barry. And, you know, uh, being a taller person doesn't hurt either. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> cool. And I, I'm going to show you the other one uh, that I thought was ter terrific. This is one with um, 
these backup singers. Yes, I really wanted this, and it's one of the few times he really, you know, uh, as some of our uh, the longtime fans will know, Barry's thing, Barry and choreography sometimes has a um, uh, a glancing relationship. But uh, I actually <laughs> like let the dancers kind of do their thing behind him, and that was uh, that was fun to see. Yeah, and he's always had some really good fun moments mm-hmm. with his backup singers through the years. You know, I've been. I've been fortunate to see him in concert quite a few times over the years. And uh, I'm going to just see if I can close that and then get back to back to normal here. I, yeah. I think I'm back to normal now. Yes, you are. Well, as normal as I can be anyway. But yeah. once, one of the greatest photos of Barry you've never seen. So, you know, you can always <laughs> come to danielcoston.com or come to my Instagram page, Daniel Coston Photos, and check out the photos for yourself. Yes, please do that. Stuff. I had so, a really uh, good time, I, and um, it was fun also to watch my wife's reaction to these songs. After all, um, she, there were certain songs she really wanted to see, and I purposely didn't tell her. I had looked and seen what the set list was in other cities, so I knew what was coming, but I didn't tell her because I didn't. Yeah, know. I try very hard to keep that stuff from yeah. other people. And you know, there were times when I look at them at a set list from a concert, and um, and I'll look at it and I say, "Oh crap, he's singing." This again, he's singing that again. He's you can't get this one on the set list, you know. And uh, but generally, when you're in the when you're actually at the concert, mm-hmm. you're enjoying it regardless. I mean, he play even now every tour. That's fine and dandy, but I'm still gonna love it, you know. Right. Um, I have seen Barry in concert roughly twelve times, maybe more than that. Um, my first time I saw Barry in concert was a gift for my sixteenth birthday. Um my sister gave this uh, sister and brother-in-law took me to see Barry Manilow at the Eurus Theater in New York City on January 2nd of 1977, which was the closing night of the show that your sister, oh no, your your wife had gone to see Daniel. So that oh, wow, okay, cool. So uh, this was uh this was the closing night, and this was the series of shows that were recorded for the 1977 Manilow Live album. And so um, it was quite exciting. I really didn't know him at all. I knew we did I Write the Songs. I knew we did Mandy. That was pretty much about it. Uh, in advance of that concert, I had gotten a couple of his albums, so I was more familiar with his songs. But I was really taken by his musicianship. The fact that he is not only, not only such a good musician, but he's he has the, the soul of, of a musician. Mm-hmm. And that comes across very well in the way that he talks about the song, and he talks about his, his, his musicians that with him and so forth. And so I, I really enjoyed that. And, um, and so um, I, I, just, and I was taken by the whole, the whole show. Uh, his humor is great. He's always had such good humor. And uh, without ice cream. And... Um, <laughs> He's done, uh, he does really, really great bits with his backup singers. And, and of course, uh, this is the show, and we'll talk a little bit more about that particular live album a little bit later on, but there's some great moments in that, on that album that have become quite famous over the years. Um, but I really enjoyed that. I saw him uh, again at Forest Hills, New York, the following year. Um, he had a cold, I remember, and he managed to get through it okay. Uh, and then I skipped all the way until 1989 when I saw him play at the Gershwin Theater in, uh, on Broadway. And this was when he was in the middle of his jazz period. He was doing the Johnny Mercer stuff and things like that. And so he has a, a bit of that in, in his act. He had just released a new album uh, at that particular time, had a couple of singles off of that. And that was a really good show, but he kind of, showcased his band and he showcased his his backing group a lot about about the idea of being on Broadway you know and uh, he had a couple of really interesting tracks like uh, the other 99 about you know auditioning for shows and things like that so I enjoyed that very much um he went to Radio City in 93 when he did the uh Greatest Hits and Then Some tour and I saw him twice during that uh, at Radio City. The first shows I had was like in the second or third row or something along those lines. 
and the second show was all the way in the very top, <laughs> way in the back, you know. I just managed to squeak in, but I wanted to see it again, and uh, and that was a, that was a great show. Um, and the next one I saw him in was, um, I believe, a mentoring show that he did at Madison Square Garden where um, they were trying to mentor uh, young African-American boys and girls. And so it was essentially Natalie Cole, boys to men, um, somebody else, I forget, and Barry Manilow. And it was a little bit fish out of water, but it was, it was a great show. He came out, he did like a 20 minute medley of all his songs. You know? <laughs> um, and then um, Radio City again in 2002 after 9-11. And this was, um, uh, again, uh, goes back to one of his live albums. He has, um, he has a live album called Two Nights Live, which I happen to like very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was done based off of that tour that he did and those nights at Radio City, because here we are, you know, in the after, after, um, after word, after something, whatever, I can't think of the word right now, of 9-11, uh, of which of course is tragic as that was, Manila seemed to have a bit of a resurgence because his music is so, so much, um, so, um, I don't know what the what, what you call it, but something. What do you call when you when you when you, when you call something that that's easy, something that's goes down comfort food, well, something comfort like food. that. Yeah, it's like it's like comfort food. And Barry very much is a New Yorker. You know, he uh, that was the thing. I even watching the show in January, it's like he's reminding me of my grandparents. He's reminding me of all these folks I knew up between upstate New York and New York City. It was just it's just an attitude. It's a it's a it's a it's a thing. It's a vibe. It's a thing. And, yeah, he's got uh, that. Yeah, he does and he, have that. And he'd done this album called Here with the Mayflower, which mm. was essentially about a New York apartment building, which to me, I think is the best thing he's ever done. Mm. And he did this album and then he did um, a song on the album called Turn the Radio Up, you know, to turn off the negative, turn off the uh, the upsetment, you know, get, get on with the positive, you know, which is definitely one of his, uh, one of his, one of his ways of, of bringing out in music, he does tends to bring out the positivity in things, as well as a uh, heartbreaking love songs. And um, but it was it was a great show, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that. Um, and I've seen him several times since then. I prefer to see him do something that is um, uh, more eclectic, so you can see a little bit of different things from his career. I love it when he plays the jazz stuff. That's great. But, you know, even if he's out there just doing the greatest hits, that's great, too, you know. And then the Radio City show that he did just this year was fantastic. And I spoke about that on an earlier episode of the podcast. So if anybody wants to go back and check that out, you can do that. But um, it was uh, absolutely fantastic to see Barry. He sounded really good. Um, that's what really surprised me because I've seen him at times when his voice has not been 100%. And uh, as you get older, you know, you can't expect it to be great. But I didn't have any problem with his voice. I thought he sounded terrific. I was up in the second mezzanine, so he looked really good to me. <laughs> and um, and, and it, was, it was a good show overall. So we had a good time. Yep. Glad to hear that. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the Manilow live albums. Mm -hmm. uh, do we, you guys have a particular favorite live album? That one. I mean, that's one of the first records of his I, I had. I mean, obviously, you know, hate Double Live. Always loved some Double Live back in the 70s. Yeah, and right. uh, all the photos, obviously, it's it's interesting now, having grown up to be a photographer, I, there were certain records I look back, I just devoured the, the visuals there was that there was uh, I actually just picked up another copy of it was the uh, five, the fifth dimension record that where Leora Neiman did the paintings both on the cover and inside I remember just being fascinated by that as a kid so mm -hmm. like, I would just look at all the pictures 
characters on that record and then the music of course and looking back at the set list i was i was struck again obviously the first ever appearance of the very strange medley uh mm -hmm. which is always fun to see you know you forget oh yeah he's he's been a working <laughs> musician for a very long, a long time. time yes um nice now i listen again it's you know, it's probably one of the first places i heard things like you know the jump shop boogie medley the bandstand boogie you know all these things that i i uh you know i first heard through my grandparents uh, through their big band records but now i have a very a much deeper and very different appreciation for that um and of course daybreak and weekend and weekend in new england you know it, it all builds up on side four uh so yeah it's it's um it, it brings back a lot of good memories cool and lance you have the album there right i yeah there you there go is right there you go there he is young and, and exciting and energetic and ready to go and give a great show and, and darn it forget about streaming let's have this <laughs> have the photos let's have the credits of the songs let's right. experience it but that's, that's just right. my little rant but you know um actually this album is i just discovered it a few days ago i didn't even know i had this in my collection there um but my i would say my favorite live berry would be the one that you mentioned earlier which is the broadway one live yeah. broadway only yeah. because like you you guys saw barry in the 70s i discovered him in the 90s so i'm looking back at a different period a different wavelength you know but um i think that live album it tells a story more you know here's yes. building you know i was a struggling guy a long way up coming from nowhere and that resonated with me playing in bands in Youngstown um just playing for five people and I still had you know just a love of music or you know a song about you know a long lost love you know Mandy obviously you know and stuff like that but this album here it, I I got reawakened to it um by you know and I'm just you know like I said, you guys were, you know, saw him in the 70s and then I, I didn't discover him until the 90s. So I mean, I have probably a different perspective of it than what you guys know of. And but it's in a, you know, we can get into it in a bit. But um, yeah, this was like a history lesson for me. And the first studio Barry Manilow album I had was the one that you mentioned in 89, which was that purple album, I think. Yeah. I it. Um, it was just titled, just titled Barry Manilow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, it is right there. Because uh, you know, I had the, some greatest hits from like BMG and stuff like that, and my Best Buy locally didn't have any studio albums, so I had to. Nice. Take Could you read, off, you read off the track listing off that album? This is some really good songs. Uh, please don't be scared. Keep each other warm. Once and for all, the one that got away. Um, I think this one's on the Broadway one too. When good thing, uh, wait, good things come again some good things never last that's the one i was oh, yeah 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 um another world you you begin again my moonlight memories of you mm -hmm. anyone can do the heartbreak and uh it was also which was on the greatest hits dvd uh little traveling music please yeah that's it i love, love traveling music yeah please. that's a great it's a great track but and then he's got he's got a track on there well, the one that got away is my favorite song from that from from that record. Mm -hmm. But he does a, he does a if you go back to the live on Broadway CD that album that show, uh, he did a song on that one that's also on this Barry Manilow album um, called um, "Only the, the Good Things That Never Last." Mm -hmm. uh, only good things now. What's it called? Uh... Some good things never last. Some good things never last. And he did it with Deborah Burr. Deborah Bird, yeah. Who was the one of his back, backing singers from the 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, she's played with him for many years, on and off or whatever, but he's not every tour, but she's she's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh and so yeah, so she does does that duet with him on the live on Broadway album. Yeah. So yeah, it's very special to me. Right, yeah. I mean, I love that double disc one too, two, the Two Night Live. But, you know, like I said, this one, I'm going to be listening to this uh, 77 one more. You know, it yeah. wasn't in my, you know, you know, it's not one I dug out, but I'm, I'm, there's a lot of things in there that, you know, 
educated me. Well, about- you know what was interesting about that album? I remember from that concert is that again, I I knew the basics. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I knew a couple of songs, and then I picked up the albums afterwards. Just the way the audience responded to some of these songs that were essentially newer songs, mm-hmm. and just that they people just really responded to what he was singing about. Right, and you know? and for me, I I looked it up. You know, into this 1977 album, he only had what four studio albums out at the time. Right. So. Um, it's interesting uh, some of the choices he chose on the album. You know, I would have liked a couple other ones, but, you know, looking back at it now, you know, like I said, I'm looking at it as somebody just experiencing it in 2023, as opposed to you guys that, you know, may have known it from that time. It's just mm-hmm. interesting, uh, you know, like the, you know, the multiple times he puts beautiful music on it. It's just like, you know, no, he doesn't play the whole song, but bits and pieces. And I'm it's like, it's just very creative the way he, he yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it was something. I'm like, hmm, interesting, you know. It's so, also that's the album that he does the full version of trying to get the feeling, which is mm-hmm. if I had to make a top 10 Barry Manilow songs, that's like in the top three for me. Oh, I, I absolutely adore that song. There's an extra verse that's on the live album. Uh, that's also on the box set they put out in 93 or 94. Um, I think it's the greatest extensum box mm-hmm. set. Is that what they called it? Right, yeah. The, yeah. And um, and so there, there is a version, that, that particular version is on that album now, yeah, but it's a, it's a great, it's a great, great song, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so I, I enjoy I enjoy the album too. And I just, I, there, there are a lot of songs in there about being a musician, studio musician. Uh, which is just was an odd little song that he that he threw in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I love that very much. That's that that's a great little track. Mm-hmm. And uh, just uh, from what I remember about his humor, you know, about singing music that you know, his mother liked, and then nobody else that he knew knew what the hell he was talking about. You know, so he, <laughs> you know, so it was it's a little bit weird. Right, uh, yeah. Daniel, you ever have any thoughts on any of these Manilow albums? I really need to go back and listen to these. I knew I pretty much had everything up until the late seventies, and uh, again, it's like I, now I want to go back and revisit a lot of this because I I remember obviously remember the hits, but I also remember you know you hear songs. Oh, what's that? I, yes. I, the musician one's always an interesting one for me because I think there's a part of him that. In a different day and time, he would have been a, a, a you know a guy that worked in studios in New York for 30, 40, 50 years. He obviously came out of that scene or knew those guys. And yeah. uh, while you know, it's I'm sure he in, has enjoyed you know being able to you know take the limelight and be that guy, be Barry Manilow for all those years. I'm sure that there's also a part of him that would have been very comfortable just sitting behind the piano, uh, being, uh, being, 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 being the band leader and, and being yeah. a piano player like he did for uh, Bet Bette Midler. Uh, so it, it's kind of like it's an interesting song because it kind of he's contemplating an alternate life for yeah. himself. So um, I, yeah, like, I want to go back and listen to even now um, all those things. And again, of course, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the album covers. Surprise! Uh, but yeah, it's uh, if you haven't listened to these records in a while, definitely check them out. It's uh, yes. there's, there, there's there's gems in each one. Mm-hmm. And to, I was struck again listening ahead of today's show that he was kind of a throwback even when he started obviously you know working with Bette Midler they were well versed in everything from the 20s on but um even when you watch him on Midnight Special he's you know he's from a different era but he's suddenly the hottest guy in the U.S. so uh, it is interesting and that's part of part of his dichotomy through his whole career he has, has had his feet in many different eras and decades even when he was uh, the new kid on the block. Mm-hmm. And you know what's interesting about, you know, like you said, Daniel, he never really sought that type of career out. Mm-hmm. He was happy being behind playing piano, doing the arrangements and whatever, so conducting. And, you know, for this kind of a thing to happen to someone, this kind of fame, you know, it's, it does, it's got to do something to you. Yeah. And uh, recently I've been looking at John Lennon in a little different light because there's been so much was said about how he had a very negative reaction to Beatlemania. 
And now, how did I deserve this? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to this band? You know, and just the un the unknown association with that kind of phenomenon. You know, and uh, and you know, of course, it has a lot to do with your your overall makeup. And you know, as we know with John, I'm much trying to go off topic here, but you know, with his background, with his uh, family situation that he was in, you know, uh, that anxiety, you know, it just, just it was very difficult for him. And so you wonder how Manilow, you know, adjusted to the fact that, okay, well, all of a sudden, all this attention is being paid on me, you know. Right. And so it is, it is a trip, man. That's what they call it a trip, I guess. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, his book, I mean, I don't know if you've ever read his book, the uh, Sweet Life book. Um, I think I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty certain I've read it in there when he talked about Barry Manlow, the stage performer. It was, you know, Barry Manlow, capital letters, you know, this oh. Barry Mar and he had to struggle <laughs> trying to be the guy off stage and, you know, kind of similar, like, you know, Alice Cooper, you know, how he was Alice Cooper. And then he was trying mm -hmm. to fit. Should I be Vincent or, you know, but um, yeah, like you said, you know, Barry, the famous story is, you know, Barry went to Bette Midler and said, you know, hey, they're giving me a record deal. And she said something like, you know, doing what? You know, it's like <laughs> um, singing. And she's like, you don't sing or, you know, something like that, you know, and you're like, uh, you know, but that's one thing I like about this, listening to this album for the first time is I'm used to, like I said, I come from a different era. I'm used to you know, him doing those big, huge holding out the notes and, uh, you know, weekend in New England or at the end when he's doing trying to get the feeling again. And then mm -hmm. on here, you hear a younger version, you know, like I'm used to the the the, the Barry Mello, we want one of the greatest performers of our era. Mm -hmm. He's comfortable in his like like your photo. Um, you know, he's there and he's, you know, I'm on stage, I'm conquering the stage, you know, and I'm hearing this and I'm hearing a young singer at times. It's like, you know, he's, he's finding his way, yeah. you know, trying to emphasize his vocals. It's like, um, you know, he still seems uncomfortable and I, you know, I'm trying to read into his mind, but um, you know, here's a guy that's still maybe awkward on stage a little bit or, you know, mm -hmm. get him behind, you know, he's okay behind the piano, but, you know, I'm waiting to hear that real long holding out that powerful note, you know, like your photo behind um, you, Ed, you know, there he is, you know, going like this or, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, the powerful, you know, this is the guy that at one time, you know, the rumor was Frank Sinatra said, this is the guy, you know, yeah. so, I mean, that's one thing I learned about the, when I listened to this uh, 77 album, it's like, Wow, I, you hear a younger version, a you know maybe a little awkward at times, but perhaps I don't you know that's just how I'm hearing it. But you know I'm I'm used to you know some of those long held out notes, and I'm not hearing it, and I'm like, oh wow, you know. And then you're thinking of Barry now, or you know a couple of years ago, or whatever, and you're like, wow, yeah. look how far he's come. You know? Right, right, right. I think that's, that that's... that album also has a little more influence of working with Bette Midler, um, because Bette Show was just just hit you with everything. And uh, he, he came out of that. It was like, okay, you know, with the dancers, the music, it's like, if you like, if you like this, you're really going to like this and just boom, boom, boom. And you really get that in the live album. I also want to uh, steer people towards the box set of rarities that got released many, many years ago and feature some early songs that Barry was doing, uh, I think during his solo set with Bed Midler. And uh, actually one of the guys on those tracks is uh, Michael Federal, uh, who's, yeah. who's he lives here in Charlotte. He's a good friend of mine. He's still still playing every Friday night or nearly every Friday night with his brother Lenny. And uh, it's been fun recently to talk with Michael about uh, those days and and the, as those each band was kind of coming together. Um, going back to your thing on fame, I'll tell you as as someone who's gotten to work with a lot of bands on the way up, fame will change you. Fame will totally turn your head around, and some come back to earth, and some don't. Yeah. And uh, I have more respect for folks like Barry who can say, I, I've had that happen, but I'm going to keep working and creating. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's harder than it looks. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, think about, you know, you go from being the background guy to the guy very quickly. And, you know, you're the one, you, you, you can't hide behind the piano on Merv Griffin, even when Merv's just being way too silly. Uh, and he's just 
gaming it, gaming through it, and and still performing his music. So, uh, um, you know, I'm I'm glad that we can still talk about you know him as, as uh, somebody who's still out there doing things all these years. Yeah, and I mean, arise right now. He's, I mean, he's just coming off this tour. Mm -hmm. um, he's been having a residency in Vegas for quite a few years now, but he's also been developing this uh, musical uh, mm -hmm. called Harmony, which is expected to open on Broadway mm. in October. And he's been on this for about 20 years now. Wow. And so uh, he wrote this with uh, his songwriting partner, Bruce Sussman, who um, was one of the lyricists on Copacabana and many of his other tracks through the years. So we have that to look forward to. But as you said, Daniel, he's uh, an artist that is continuing to grow and doing new things. And so it's very exciting. Um, I just wanted to bring out regards to the live albums. And uh, we did talk quite a bit about the 1977 live album, which is also my favorite. Um, but I wanted to bring attention to the 2004 double CD album called Two Nights Live, which I think Lance had mentioned. Um, if you wanted an album of Manilow, of him performing live, and not just hear the hits, this is a wonderful record to find. Look mm -hmm. for it uh, in your CD store, Amazon will have it. Um, what you've got here is you've got two shows essentially um, that he's combined together and um, there's a lot of songs in here that you wouldn't normally expect him to play in a concert. He does bits from Harmony. He does several songs from that upcoming show. Again, this is recorded in 2002. Now we're looking at 2023 when it's going to make its Broadway debut. So he's got this like Let Freedom Ring on here. He's got a couple of other incredible ballads on here that are very touching and uh, to his audience uh, uh, because, you know, he feels that the audience uh, takes a Manilow song and he's able to write these songs about touching people or maybe about something very sensitive in their lives, like losing someone and being able to write something along the lines of how to, how to grieve through that. And so there's a lot of really interesting tracks because that's life from the Sinatra album. Um, he does um, Who Has Been Sleeping in My Bed from <laughs> the One Voice album, which was, a, you know, one of the few so-called rockers that he's had, you know. So um, I definitely uh, recommend this one out for anyone who loves Manilow or is wanting to get to know more of his music. I love hearing, um, I think it's on one of those discs, uh, Sweet Heaven. Yes. I'm in love again. I mean, yes. You know, but I, I, I made an, I made a comment the other day when I was discussing Barry with somebody, and I said, um, "Now this is just my personal opinion, so you can argue or, or tell me I'm wrong. That's fine." Um, but I was like, "You basically what you were saying is some of these rarer songs," and I said, "You know, even seeing them live, he's yeah, you know, like you said, you would like to hear him do some more rarer stuff, perhaps." Um, same with, you know, obviously with Kiss, Kiss has done the same thing over and over and over. But um, I would say, you know, I haven't seen them lately. Like I said, the last time I saw them was what, 2011. But I was like, I can't name an artist. Maybe, I would say maybe, maybe Buble, Michael Buble, or possibly um, some, because I'm a fan of hers, but um, maybe Taylor Swift recently. But how many other artists can you say that does do some rare stuff now and then and the crowd still embraces it instead yeah. of just going to the bathroom break or you know that um, drives me up the wall right yeah. but you know like i said um that that cd was just amazing with you know that you were saying like but um yeah i was like when i saw you know when i saw him he did that you know once in love with amy or you know some rarer songs like that that's uh when he did some of those big band songs and i'm just like you know, so I was saying that the other day. I don't know if we have any artists today anymore that can actually pull that stuff off. I don't know. Do yeah, you think few. so? Or 
it's hard. I mean, that's the thing. We, we say we want to hear, you know, our, uh, my wife for years, she's a lifelong Elton John fan. And she and she's right. I would love to see him do an instrumental album. I would love to see him do a whole show of just rarities. But, you know, that people go, I don't know this song. And yeah, they go to the bar or they go to the bathroom or this and that. It's it's hard. Why? I yeah. don't understand that. I, right. It's yeah. rising up the wall. Right. Yeah, it's like you, you've paid this money and you want to hear stuff that you haven't heard before or haven't do before. That's that's the things I really enjoy about a concert experience. Um, and just just to give the uh, the artist the um, the respect yeah. of stand being there while he's on stage. Or he's on stage, you know, and listen to this orchestra. Uh, you know, even if even if you don't necessarily know this, like like with McCartney, it happens every time he does something from the new album. They mm -hmm. all start going for the beer. I'm right. like, you know, you're only here to sing Hey Jude. Is that your whole purpose of being here? And I and and I don't and it, it blows my mind, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of, yeah, in go terms of, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I see in terms of songs that sometimes gets forgotten, uh, I was bringing this up with my wife recently, was the song Read Them and Weep, which yes. I, always reminds song. me of moving to North Carolina, because that, that happened around the time I moved to North Carolina. But that's Jim Steinman. And mm -hmm. I, I yes. dare say it's one of the few times that Steinman worked with an artist that wasn't completely overblowing his voice. Uh, he tended to like very throaty singers. And uh, Barry's doing, it's, it's, Barry's hitting it harder than he sometimes does, but it's still very measured and it works for that song. And, and I, knew that, so I know that song backwards and forwards because of when that came out. And my wife was like, yeah, I don't know that one. So uh, uh, <laughs> it's one of those where, I, you know, he worked with a lot of different collaborators, but um, I always, it, again, it's, it would be, if he has the chance, you know, as he's working on this new musical, which I'm excited to hear about and other things, right. I still think there's more life to, to Barry. I still think there's a few more things he hasn't gotten to do yet. So a few more collaborations like that, I'd, 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 I'd be listening. Well, I know he has, supposedly he has two, new albums of original material that are expected to come out sometime, Ooh. well, sometime this year, I guess the next couple of years. So, uh, you know, he is working. So that's very cool at 80 years old, you know, and it, you know, when you, when you see Manilow in concert, you figure he's going to do 15 to 20 songs or maybe, you know, if given medleys, you know, we don't know how, maybe 20 songs, right? You figure someone's yeah. in that ballpark. But you kind of figure that, you know, at 75, 80 something years old, it's 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 hard to expect them to do a whole lot more than that. Right. Um, and so that's why it is a little frustrating when you want to hear something more uh more rare in sure. concert because you know generally you want to you do you do want you do want the, the hits to be played, but you know. Right. Well, also, you know, like you said, he's been around for how many years? You know, he's so, been around forever. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's been he around. wrote the very first song. Yeah, that, well, right. Bruce Johnson may say otherwise, but you know, who knows? <laughs> David Cassidy says otherwise, but you know, I Bruce mean, Johnson says a lot of things, but that's for a whole other podcast. Well, yeah, so. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So is Mike Love, but we'll get, we'll not go there. Another <laughs> podcast. Yeah, anyway. but I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of hard for him because you know you got to please the people, and you know, I mean, you know, he would be, you know, he would be up there doing, like I said again, you know, he would be doing like a four-hour set like Taylor Swift's been doing. You know, I don't think he could do that, you know. And but uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, but throwing back just to this uh, seventy-seven album, one of my favorite songs off of this one is "Why Don't We Live Together." Oh, that's a great song, and I thought. No, I'm, you know, the, the, you know, I, I always had this thing where I pictured him singing this song with a, like a see-through, you know, carpet behind him with the spotlight on him. And then when he said as an opener song, because when I saw him live a couple of times, he opened, you know, yeah, I get, get it. This, you know, 77 album, you need the up-tempo song to get you going with writers or whatever. But I could, you know, I saw Barry a couple of times and he opened with um, Ready to Take a Chance again, you know, yeah. a slow song. So he could pull it off. But I always thought that, you know, Why Don't We Live Together would be a cool opener with him behind a black, black you know, carpet or whatever, straight yeah, yeah. or whatever. And then when he says it's time to drop the curtain, they drop it down, you know, and then he walks off, you know, down the steps or whatever. And I always yeah. just thought that that would have been, and on, on this version here, the guitar work is so funky listening 
it's like a mix between funk and R&B that, you know, another, you know, we talk about Barry as, you know, big band, easy listening, pop, but, you know, some of his musicians on here. You got a solid band. Funky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, like I said, I, I, that's one of my favorite songs off this whole album. And it's just, you know, just, I, you know, I always love, would love to hear him do that live. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be able to see him live again in the future and more new recordings and all kinds of things. And maybe another live album, who knows? Uh, he's had quite a resurgence this year and it's been very exciting to see. So, um, Guys, um, I'm just going to ask you just to give you your credit information again, where people can reach out to you, and then um, and then we'll kind of sign off. Uh, Lance, want to start? Oh, okay. Um, you can find me on Facebook, or um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram um, at lovely Lance L. Uh, the reason being is because in the pro wrestling world. Uh, Jim Cornette was a famous manager and I was on his uh, podcast several times and there was a tag team called the Valiant Brothers and Handsome Jimmy and Luscious Johnny and he thought my name Lance Lumley would have been a great manager name so you had Handsome and Luscious so you had to have Lovely so Lovely <laughs> and, and I was like oh, I gotta put that in my Twitter and uh, so you can find me on there and my website again it's on the WordPress so it's free um there's something for everybody on there it's books uh music movies rare movies um anything like that is uh lance writes at dot wordpress.com and reach out to me and you know let's chat or you know i'm easy to get along with <laughs> i think cool daniel please yeah, hey there. Um, I I am Daniel, uh, still am Daniel Costin. Uh, DanielCostin.com. Instagram, Daniel Costin Photos. Uh, Facebook, just Daniel Costin. Uh, definitely check out the circle, uh, thecircle.com, and stay tuned for our, uh, the album coming out on Big Stir Records next year. Uh, definitely check out the Left Bank record I co produced uh, at OmnivoreRecordings.com. And please stay tuned for more information about another upcoming project, which I'm really, really proud of. And um, definitely some cool things coming up. Uh, I'll be doing an exhibit of photos here in Charlotte uh, next month, hopefully, and some more news on that. And always, yeah, check out uh, Ed and I on the uh, Plastic EP's uh, Wild Shindigs. Uh, you know, uh, he's, he, he is the. Uh, plastic is the wild man in his own shows so uh yeah. we we all just kind of like do our thing around him so uh but definitely a lot of fun and um and so yeah and uh, i will mention too i met jim Cornette in 1984 at crockett park uh here in charlotte so uh yeah, yeah. Old, yay old school <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly cool. very cool and uh as for me uh, you can reach out to me at ed rising on facebook uh, you can reach me on my new YouTube uh, channel. Uh, just uh, go into YouTube and and uh, search for Ed Rising, and you'll see the videos for the podcast uh, there. And that's growing, so it's still, still in a bit of works. And um, and then uh, you could always email me at erising4 at aol.com. Uh, my name is Ed Rising, and this is Ed's Popomatic Podcast. I want to thank my guests, Lance and Daniel, for being here today. And I want to uh, thank you for joining our podcast. And uh, we're a retro pop culture podcast uh, where everything retro beats are new if you keep it in your heart. And I wish you a good night. And God bless. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>